as we move forward here to these final philosophers. Um, 1881 to 1964, this is Clive Bell. We are now getting into a more contemporary um, time. We're getting into the 20th century and we're getting into more 20th century ideas about art. Now, for Clive Bell, he was interested in the emotional components, in the feeling um, of a work of art, but he claimed that the emotions of the artist um, did not contribute to aesthetically experiencing a work of art. One of, this is a big change in idea. The big thing for me about this is that Clive Bell thought and felt that the work of art, this, was not just a way to, to get back to the idea of who made this, yeah? This was separate from the artist, you know? He felt that if this work was significant, what it achieved was significant form. I love that idea significant form because he thought that great works of art become became bigger than the sum of the parts that this is clay and paint but if it comes together with what the artist has done that the form here becomes greater than just clay and paint now many dancers know that because we could train a monkey to put together movements and to pick, oh, let's put this arabesque with this tendu, with this degage, with this tour en l'air, that these things could just go together. Anyone can string any movements together and choose them, whether you had any dance training or not. But Clive Bell would say a significant choreographer is able to put those together in a way where the work becomes greater than the sum of all of those things. Yeah, it's a fantastic idea. And I challenge you, when you look at works of art, think about Clive Bell. It's a great question. Does this achieve significant form? Yeah, it's, or is it just uh, an amalgamation? Yeah, that for me, that's one of the reasons when you see works that blow you away, like Van Gogh's Starry Night, it has significant. This is Suzanne Langer. One, uh, probably, let me just simply say she's my favorite philosopher. I, I adore her. I think, um, I also adore her because she's a woman and philosophy is often a man's world. She was rather beat up by the men, um, in, you know, because um, her ideas were rather ahead of their time. And I think it was because she was a woman in a man's world of philosophy. Um, Suzanne Langer, um, thought then when works of art were successful, they created apparition. So art as apparition. Now, you can think, what is an apparition? You know, um, things like a rainbow are an apparition, yeah, a mirage. She said that art was an illusion. Now you could say, oh my God, how, how can a dance be an illusion? But uh, I'll say this, there's something about it when it's happening, where things come together and you live in the world of this motion. Yeah. Now, perhaps we see it more with a painting because we can look at a two-dimensional canvas and the apparition that is created with the paint is that this two-dimension, this flat space, is a world that we can dive into and it's got three dimensions and it can take us anywhere. So she would say that is the virtual part of this piece. She said that space was the virtual part of the painting, that that was the apparition that was being created was space. Yeah. Now she would say that dances and probably we can link theater with this too, that they are dynamic images, that they are ever-changing and they're moving much like a waterfall is moving, that that is the apparition that gets created. And then when the dance is over, it's like the waterfall stops. So when we're in the apparition of all of that world of motion, we are in a very special place. 
If we jump back to Clive Bell, he would say, if it's good, it's significant. It's a significant space that we are in with those materials. So for Suzanne Langer, the materials were real. The paint, the clay, but there's an apparition where we look at this and we see this other world and this other image of what is happening on that surface of this piece. But also the clay comes together with this kind of form. Clyde Bell would say the reason why we love Alixos is that this shape has a significant form to it. Here's an image of a fountain. Sometimes people will see apparitions in things like someone might see a face in this part where the water has stained the rock there. Yeah, rainbows, mirages also. Um, this is a quote by um, Suzanne Langer. Illusion is the stuff of art, the stuff out of which the semi-abstract yet unique and often sensuous expressive form is made. To call the art image illusory is simply to say that it is not material. It is not cloth and paint smooches, but space organized by balanced shapes with dynamic relation tensions and resolution among them. <laughs> She's wonderful. Yeah, it's also fun. I encourage you. I put a bibliography um, in Web Campus at where a lot of these ideas, a lot of these quotes come from. So I encourage you, if you end up like I did, adoring these ideas about art, go back and read them in their source materials. What I'm trying to do is just take it apart and put it back together for you and give you a quick way of knowing it. But um, do go swim and dive into the original pools of thought because these sources are just magical and they will shape the way you look at the world and the way you look at the art world. Um, if we just, let me just show you this painting. So when we talk about the two dimensions of a space, this is Renoir. And you can even see that there are certain techniques that are done. If you look at the way the lines go, it creates a perspective. Perspective is the crowning glory of the Renaissance. And you can see where that crown and glory has now manifested itself in this impressionistic era with this painting, where this is not no longer just paint smooches, to use Susan Langer's word, on cloth, on canvas. What you're now seeing is you're now seeing this summer party on this river um, here that there's a three-dimensional world. It is a virtual realm that we are invited to look into. Just even to notice there's certain technical things about this. If you look at this painting, the guy with the black top hat in the back, you'll see that that head is so much smaller than the the heads of the people in the front of the painting. What we, and I can say the front of the painting and all of you knew what I meant. That the pe there are some people that your eyes have perceived as this is further away from me and this is closer to me. The lines of the guy on the left hand of the painting who's leaning on the railing, the woman leaning on that railing, that railing creates a kind of diagonal which is showing you space, going backwards, yeah. And so, again, that's the part of the virtual way that, that Renoir, in a masterful way, created three dimensions out of a two-dimensional space with paint on cloth. Suzanne Langer said that space was the primary illusion of a painting. In music, she said the primary illusion was movement. I loved that idea when she said it because it said to me, well, 
uh, duh, now I get why we like to move to music so much. Because if when we hear music, we also are seeing movement, what we're doing with dance is then we're putting dance to that also. And we're enhancing it even more. Um, that, um, and she said that with music, it, it, the apparent movement is in time. She said it's not clock time, but it's lived time. And we feel that. For dance, she called it a dynamic image. Yeah, much like that waterfall. And there is a world, all of you um, who are theater practitioners, all of you who are dancers, will know that when we are in a play or a piece, we are in a dynamic form. It is, it is running, it is operating. And I even say that's the reason we have a stage manager, because there is someone in charge of the flow of the work, and we want to encounter and we want to deal with that flow. Yeah, and we want someone to be manning the ship to do that. Yeah, so wonderful, wonderful ideas to think about and to ponder. Yeah, here's one more Langer quote because I do adore her. Every work of art is wholly a creation. It doesn't have illusory and actual elements that are co-mingling in it. Materials are actual, but art elements are always virtual. And it is elements that an artist composes into an apparition, an expressive form. Yeah. There's a great book, and it's called Problems of Art by Suzanne Langer. I encourage you to read it. It's the best book to start with. In fact, I think I've put a couple, a couple things in um, some of our extra readings um, in our section in Web Campus so that you can read some Suzanne Langer from Problems of Art. But it's a great little book. You can often buy it on Amazon for pennies and just have them ship it to you from some used bookstore um, somewhere. So it's, it's, it's great. I encourage you to read some Suzanne Langer. She's a favorite. Yeah. She even said things like um, virtual space. She talked about virtual space with a piece that some pieces, it didn't matter what the size of it, but some species, some work seemed bigger than others and had bigger virtual space and some seemed smaller. Um, if I'm talking to choreographers out here, but we know that in dance, that some dances seem huge. They seem like they, were, they happen in vast, vast, big spaces. And some dances seem so intimate and small that we want to put them in a small pool of light and we want to just see just this person and this movement in this smaller amount of space. So she was really onto something in her ideas about um, what art was. Yeah. Apparition. Here is Arthur Danto. Yeah, Arthur Danto, um, 1924 to 2013, passed away not so long ago. Um, and Danto declared at some point the death of art. Um, and he said that now anything can be art. And sometimes people will tell me that. It's like, well, anything in the world can be art if we say, or an artist says that it is. Maybe Duchamp started that with that urinal or really challenged that with that urinal and with that snow shovel um, back there um, during that time. Um, Dento was a philosopher, he was a critic. He was interested in the modern art of the 20th century. He dealt a lot with Andy Warhol, Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes primarily. And he, was, he particularly dealt with how could ordinary objects be works of art? Yeah, ultimately this um, took him to these ideas that um, conceptual, in the 20th century became the thing art was interested in, is the concepts behind the work. Um, many of you now, when you do works of art um, and you, when you design, someone will ask you, what's your concept? What, what's the concept behind this choreography? What's the concept behind the play? How are you going to deal with um, the materials? So he thought that there was an aboutness and a conceptual part that had to do with interpretation. And he said that it, art no longer had to be beautiful, it no longer had to be pleasurable, and it even no longer had to look like art anymore. 
that that was a kind of new phenomenon and new world. And so he declared that old world of art dead. 69, um, he declared that dead. And he said this ushered in the postmodern era of art. Um, I'm going to do an entire lecture on postmodernism and post-structuralism and structuralism so that you can sort of grapple with the ideas of how that world changed because nowadays we deal with those changes in the world and the conceptual parts of the world and the deconstructions that we create of that world um, entirely now. So um, this really allowed for new and for anything to be works of Art. In this little drawing here, we see um, the Brillo boxes. I'll show you some other examples of um, Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. But what he did was he created these objects, these sculptures that looked exactly like what you might buy at Walmart. It's like here's a, a big box of Brillo pads. So, and Brillo pad was a scouring pad that you would clean your dirty pans with. So again, a very ordinary object suddenly being a work of Here's another great little fun cartoon that we'll end with here and says, um, this is a man who's obviously lost in the museum and he's now on some of the upper floors of a building. And this woman comes to the door and he's looking at her as if he's looking at a work of art. And she says, wait, you're on the wrong floor. The Museum of Modern Art is downstairs. <laughs> so um, it's kind of humorous because it's like, you know, he, here he is listening and he thinks he's looking at a work of art and she's just telling him, um, this is just, this is my apartment and this is me. So this is, there's no art here. Um, so anyway, quite funny and um, fun. Okay, we'll end this right here at this moment.